I'm Jude Robbins. I'm the director of the Humpback Whale Studies Program. The Humpback Whale Studies Program is the longest running program at the Center for Coastal Studies. And over the course of the past four decades, uh, our work has basically um, unlocked facts about individual whales, which has led us to understand more about their populations and the species overall. Um, our work really has the impact that it has though because of the talented and dedicated team that are, we have around us. And tonight um, we're very lucky to have um, two of our Humpback Whale Program staff and they're gonna give us some background on the program and also insights into the programs and projects that they've been personally invested in themselves. Um, so first up, we're gonna have Jen Tackerberry who if I'm counting correctly, has 18 years of experience with marine mammals 12 of those years with us. Uh, she recently returned to the Center for Coastal Studies after completing a master's degree and expanding her research and her disentanglement experience um, to the West Coast. And Jen is gonna introduce us to how long-term studies of individuals can enhance our understanding of the whale, of the behavior and the social dynamics of whales. And then after Jen, we are gonna hear from Paulette Durazo. Paulette also has a master's degree and she's been working with marine mammals for a decade as well. And Paulette joined us from Mexico in 2019 and quickly made herself invaluable both to um, this program and to the Marine Animal Entitlement Response Team. So Paulette is gonna give you uh, a glimpse into an ongoing project that she's been working on um, to study the injuries that the individuals um, in this population receive from entanglement and what studying th those injuries can help us to understand about that issue and um, its impacts. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to Jen and Paulette. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Paulette and I will be sharing some of our research uh, at the Center for Coastal Studies as examples of how our work is advancing science and conservation by studying humpback whales as individuals. So for those of you who are new to our community, the Center for Coastal Studies is a nonprofit founded in 1976. Uh, we're dedicated to marine research, stewardship, and education. There's a wide range of research that occurs at the center spanning from population biology to water quality. We're internationally known in the marine mammal uh, research community and the large whale disentanglement practices in the United States started here at the center. Now tonight we'll be focusing on the Humpback Whale Studies program, which started in the 1970s and focuses on population biology. Now our goal each year is to document as many individuals as possible throughout the Gulf of Maine. That means we have over 40 years of sightings and life history data. Uh, we curate the catalog uh, for the Gulf of Maine Humpback Whales and uh, we collaborate both domestically and internationally with our partners. So by knowing individuals and studying them over multiple generations, we're able to advance the science and conservation of the species on many fronts. So at the individual level, our research leads to a better understanding of survival, reproduction, behavior, and health. And then this information contributes to the population studies addressing population status, critical habitats, and human impacts. So uh, tonight, we'll be focusing on two different topics. Um, as uh, Juke said, I'll be focusing on uh, behavior of humpback whales, and this is from some of my thesis work out at uh, Moss Landing Marine Labs in San Jose State University. And so the questions I was answering are, uh, does age, sex, or reproductive state influence how a whale feeds, how much time it feeds, and who it feeds with? And then Paulette will be focusing uh, more about studying wounds and scars on individuals um, and how that improves our understanding of conservation threats uh, through human impact. So I'm sure many of you are very familiar with humpback whales. Um, for those of you who are new to the species, this is a, a brief rundown, but um, the scientific name for humpback whale is Megotra novi Angliae, and that means big winged New Englander. So they're named for their very large uh, flipper or pectoral fin. They are baleen whales, which means they don't have teeth. Instead, they have baleen plates, um, which they can use to filter the food out from the water. So they're a rogal species, which means they have cleats. So that means they take a huge mouthful of water and fish, close their mouth, uh, push the water out through the baleen, and that traps their prey on the inside. Uh, humpbacks focus on bait fish and krill. Unlike a lot of toothed whales, uh, like dolphins, uh, humpback whales do not travel in family groups or pods. Um, the longest association is between the mother and calf pair, and that lasts about a year. However, uh, 
whichever feeding ground they end up on is the one that their mom brought them to. So they'll use the same feeding ground that their mother uses and their half siblings. So there's a maternally driven site fidelity to their feeding grounds. And then we keep track of individuals based on their natural uh, fluke patterns and dorsal fin shapes, which I'll get into a little bit in the future. But um, here in the Gulf of Maine, we can tend to name them based on different markings and it just uh, makes it a little easier to do, keep track of them in the field. So we'll be focusing on humpback whales in the North Atlantic. And the Gulf of Maine is our study site. So uh, Paulette and I are here at the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown on the tip of Cape Cod. And the Gulf of Maine ranges from the waters around Cape Cod up into the Bay of Fundy in Canada. Now the Gulf of Maine is the southernmost feeding ground uh, in the North Atlantic for these humpbacks. And then they go down to the breeding grounds during the winter months, uh, so in the Caribbean, as well as in the Cape Verde Islands, which is off of Africa. And then depending on which feeding ground you belong to, you go to different um, breeding grounds. So most of our whales here in the Gulf of Maine uh, breed down in the Caribbean. So they'll mate or give birth down in the Caribbean, uh, gestation periods of about a full year uh, that they're pregnant. And then they'll come up to the feeding grounds in the cooler, um, more productive waters of the North Atlantic to feed all summer. And as I said before, uh, the calves will go to the same feeding grounds that their mom showed them during the first year of their life. Now we know this by tracking individuals based on their, their natural patterns. So they can range from all white to all black and everything in between. And for the most part, these patterns are consistent throughout their life after the first few years. So when they're a calf, it's a, a little foggy and then they become um, that solid color and they either get a little lighter, or a little darker usually. But once they reach that um, adult pigmentation, that doesn't change much. Now they also have natural scars uh, that they can get from predators like um, orcas or killer whales. Those are called rake marks. Um, and they're just uh, bite wounds that have scarred over or they can have circular patterns from things like barnacles. Now, on top of the natural scars, they can also get um, anthropogenic scars or scars caused by human interaction. So unfortunately, this whale was hit by a boat. And so you can see it's missing half its fluke from where a propeller um, cut it off. And then other whales will get scars from entanglements. And so um, not only can we use these wounds to help track the individuals, but for these whales that we know, we can actually see uh, when their flukes changed and understand um, these big um, events throughout the life and when they occur. Now, in addition to their flukes, we can also use their dorsal fins. Um, once again, unlike dolphins, their, their dorsals um, are quite unique and, and have a, a bunch of natural different shapes to them. On top of that, they can have white scarring, which is either uh, natural or can be caused by damage by other humpback whales. Down in the breeding grounds, the males will compete to mate. And so they can actually uh, cause scars on other males or um, such wounds that their dorsal fins will change shape. They can have, once again, those uh, bite marks from the orcas or um, human impact again. So this is an example of ship strikes. So in addition to those fluke patterns, um, especially when it comes to calves, when we keep track of individuals by their dorsal fin, we're able to um, know a calf even if it doesn't fluke during its first year of life. And so once we can document an individual, um, we can start to piece together their, their family tree, basically, their maternal lineage. Uh, so especially if it's a female, we can keep track of every offspring she's had and then who their offspring are um, of the, her daughters and so on. So we can have these family lines um, with uh, offspring, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And this is what makes the Gulf of Maine so unique is the fact that we have so much detail about each individual. So we can know when a, a female was pregnant, when what age she was, when she had her first calf. Um, and that's uh, really unique to um, many humpback whale populations don't have that deal, a uh, great deal of detail for so many um, individuals in their population. So since we have all that information, we can start to look at how uh, age, sex, and reproductive um, state affect their feeding behavior. And so the questions, once again, were how does that affect uh, the methods that they use to feed, as well as the percentage of time they spend foraging? Now, on top of all the data that the center collects, uh, we still need to um, collaborate with a lot of other folks to be able to answer this question. So this is just a list of some of the senior scientists, um, as well as some photos of uh, folks that worked in the field and in the lab to make this study possible. But in order to study how they're feeding, you need to know what they're feeding on. 
And here in the Gulf of Maine, their primary prey species is sand lance or sand eels. And they're small bait fish, sort of like a pencil uh, that can bury themselves in the sand or the substrate. And so these whales use four different methods to feed uh, primarily. And that's uh, lunge feeding, which is the whale will just accelerate, open its mouth and take a huge mouthful of water and fish. Uh, there's bubble feeding where the whale will release bubbles uh, prior to lunging to help corral the fish. And then there's kick feeding, uh, which is really only found here in the Gulf of Maine, where the whale will actually cause a disturbance at the surface by usually slapping its tail, sometimes its head, and then might blow bubbles as well uh, before lunging. And then since the sand lance can bury themselves in the sands, our whales also feed at the bottom of the ocean. So they'll swim along the substrate and stir up the fish and feed down there as well. Now, in order to see who's doing what behavior, we need to be able to see what the whales are doing beneath the substrate. And so we put suction cup tags on the whales. Um, and not only do these tags record every movement that the whale makes, but it also has a video camera. So we can see when the whale released bubbles, we can see the bottom, um, if there's enough light or uh, the sand lance in the water column. And so by tagging these whales, we could combine um, their behavior subsurface with all their life history data to answer our question. So comparing males and females, we found that females uh, use bottom feeding more often than males did. Within females, we found that females used bubble feeding and bottom feeding more so than lunge feeding or kick feeding. Now we also compared uh, within adults and we found that adults also tended to use bubble feeding and bottom feeding more often than lunge feeding or kick feeding. Within juveniles, um, in, on our deployments, we only saw bubble feeding and bottom feeding. Um, we didn't detect any kick feeding or lunge feeding by juveniles, but we did have a confounding factor where longer tag deployments meant that we usually detected more feeding behavior. So if a tag was on a whale for 24 or 48 hours, you're more likely to see all the different feeding behaviors than if the tag was on for a shorter time. And with the juveniles, unfortunately, most of their deployments were on the shorter side. So we need to tag more juveniles before we can say for sure that they actually have an aversion to kick feeding or lunge feeding rather than we just weren't able to capture those behaviors uh, during our deployments. Now, when we looked at um, the amount of time individuals spent eating, we actually didn't see um, that their demographic state influenced that. There was a, a wide range that different individuals were doing, um, but we did see a trend where um, that suggests mothers uh, may spend more time feeding than juvenile females. Uh, so once again, we need to put uh, some more tags out, collect a little more data to be able to say if this is um, real um, or if this just happened to be a trend in our data. So once we were able to look at how demographic state influenced which feeding method they were more likely to use, we want to look more closely at kick feeding. And so we want to see if um, this behavior, which is coordinated, um, if the, the whales uh, alternated their roles. So a whale would slap the surface um, and then another whale would just come up through that disturbance. So they weren't putting in an equal amount of energy um, to be able to capture food. So we want to see if it was a form of cooperation, sort of like I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, I'll kick this time, you kick for me next time. Or if that wasn't evident, if there was some reason that individuals weren't filling both roles. So could it be that um, a whale just didn't know how to kick feed because it was too young and so it just wasn't able to do that behavior. So in order to answer that question, we used focal follow data from the Whale Center of New England. And with that, we would go out and uh, watch these whales and use an 80 code ethogram to just um, record every single behavior that they were doing. So in this instance, we had a whale named Division that we saw uh, kick feeding. And so she was the actor, she was the one doing the action. And she was with another whale named Tunguska who came up through her disturbance or her bubble cloud, but didn't kick. So he um, benefited from her actions or received uh, the ability to feed without having to put in um, that extra energy. And so by going through all this data, we were able to come up with a study population record um, who was feeding by themselves and which uh, whales were feeding together in pairs in that coordinated fashion. 
So we came up with 62 kick feeding pairs during a, a five year study. And that's what this diagram is, just the interaction between individuals. So you had a whale that was an actor and then an arrow uh, points to the receiver or the whale that was benefiting from the other whale's action. In this case, we looked to see if there was any role exchange. So uh, was there a case where a whale was a kick feeder with a receiver and then they switched roles? And we only had two occurrences of that. So it wasn't, um, most whales did not do that. And there, for each of those cases is only uh, one time that they switched roles. So then we looked for long-term partnerships. Maybe these whales don't exchange roles, but maybe there's uh, groups of or pairs of whales that feed really well together. So they can coordinate their actions and it benefits them both somehow. Unfortunately, there were only a few occurrences of that. Um, there was only um, four occurrences between three uh, kickers where they kicked multiple times for the same whale. And each one of those only occurred twice. So once again, it wasn't very evident. Um, it wasn't like year after year groups of whales did this over and over. So we thought, well, uh, since the feeding ground, uh, it is maternally driven. So uh, there is site fidelity in that fashion. So maybe um, animals that are more closely related um, pair up. And so they're helping out their relatives. So we looked um, to see if there was any evidence of that and we didn't find that. So there's no cases in our data of a mother and offspring pair or half siblings pairing up to, to kick together. So then we thought, well, maybe it's an experience. So maybe the receiver just doesn't have the skills or um, it's just not able to be the kicker. And so it's forced to be a receiver. And that wasn't the case. We had quite a few individuals that were both kickers and receivers, but just with different whales. And so they definitely had the skill set to be a kicker and chose not to be in some instances. So there's no evidence uh, that suggested cooperation between these individuals. So then we want to look at their demographic state to see if that influenced which role they filled. And we found that females were more likely to be actors, males were more likely to be receivers, and then uh, female actors with male receiver was the most common pairing with uh, a male actor and a male receiver being the least common. For reproductive state, pregnant females were more likely to be receivers than mothers were. And for the age, 75% of the time, females were older than their male partners. And in same-sex pairs, the adult actor uh, was usually younger than the receiver. So these are pretty interesting findings. Um, and some of them can be explained uh, by an avoidance of associating by a specific demographic. So as I said earlier, down in the breeding ground, the males are actually competing to mate. And so they're um, being actually aggressive towards each other. Now we don't see that behavior up here on the feeding grounds, but there have been studies to show that males are less likely to associate with other males and more likely to associate with females up here on the feeding grounds. And that would explain um, with these kick feeding pairs, uh, why we're seeing um, female actors with male receivers more so than male-male um, pairings. With the mothers um, down the breeding grounds, and once again, this has been seen up here on the feeding grounds as well, um, mother and calf pairs are less social than, let's say, pregnant females, and so they're less likely um, to be seen with other whales in general. So in this case, uh, pregnant females are more likely to be receivers, and that could be just because mothers are less likely just to join up with a, a kick feeder who's already kicking. When it comes to age, um, partly the social structure in the southern Gulf of Maine could explain uh, why um, females tend to be older than their male partners. So in the Gulf of Maine, the Southern Gulf of Maine is dominated by mother and calf pairs and juveniles. Whereas in the Northern Gulf of Maine, um, you're more likely to find um, older males. And so it could be that when you're a female, you reach a certain age down here in the Southern Gulf of Maine, if you randomly come across another male, he's more likely to be younger than you than older than you. So it's the social structure more so um, and random interactions that are likely dictating these partnerships than individuals seeking out certain individuals um, because they prefer to cooperate with them. So with our results um, of this study, we found that the demographic state influences the feeding methods and possibly the uh, percentage of time they spend feeding. Um, but then the social preference and population structure seems to outweigh any apparent benefit of repeated associating when individuals are kick feeding together. 
So one example of the broader impact or why this study is important is the extensive use of bottom feeding um, by females. Um, and it suggests that this is a, a critical feeding method for this population. So therefore, um, it likely ex um, causes females and their calves to be possibly uh, more exposed to entanglements along the substrate than other demographic states. So this could be taken into consideration with future studies um, about entanglement risks, uh, just because most of the human impact studies tend to concentrate on the surface and midwater rather than the substrate. Um, so it's sort of like studies like this that help um, us understand um, behavior at an individual level and how that informs habitat use and human threats to at a, a population level. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Paulette and let her talk about um, the study about impacting, or sorry, study about human impacts and threats uh, to these whales. Um, so yeah, I will talk about the human impacts on whale. And um, so of all the human activities that had an effect on whales that cause injury and death, ship strikes and entanglements are the best understood. And in fact, most of the information that we know about this come from this part of the United States, the US um, East Coast. When it, comes, um, when it comes about entanglements, these uh, often occur unwitnessed, and if the animal get to break free, occasionally it will carry the gear, and if that animal is lucky, it will get detected before the entanglement cause serious wounds or worse case leading to uh, others to die from different causes like chronic infection, immediately drowning or long-term starvation. In this video, you can see the moment where my team witnessed a well-known whale, well whale car called Purdue getting entangled. Uh, this event had time in 2018. And before this event, we have seen uh, her every year for decades. Um, but after that intervention, uh, it was never seen um, again. Oh. Um, so how we can, like, which, in, how we understand entanglement. Um, for most part of the world, uh, violin whales entanglements are identified by the uh, examination of stranded animals. Uh, and opportunistic reports, but the information gathered among these has limitation and doesn't allow us to understand effects of entanglements on a population level. So um, thanks to long-term study, like, um, like the one done uh, here with the gopher main humpback whales, we can understand factors that can be contributing to entanglements, such uh, the age class or the sex of the animal. We can determine the fate of the individuals involved in observed events, uh, evaluate lethal effect, such in the such um, entanglement impacts on the rub reproductive rates on whales, we can determine entanglement duration and assess the nature and severity of the injuries. Um, it's, I'm just going to repeat that or what Jen said before, but we, we identify all the individual humpback whales involved in um, reported entanglements. Um, and the ability to identify these individuals and monitor them over time allowed us to develop these type of um, studies, scar studies, which are a systematic way of estimating entanglement rates. So when a whale gets entangled uh, in fishing gear, uh, that can cause serious injuries that end uh, scars that will likely stay on the whale through its life. Um, previous studies uh, look after the 
cloud of fluke and insertion of uh, after the cloud of peduncle and fluke insertion, which is this area, this area over here. And for and and they look for entanglement inter, uh, evidence. Uh, and maybe you are asking why like, why this part? Um, well, because based on all the documentation done on uh, in every uh, disentanglement, we know that this body part it's uh, frequently implicated on the entanglement, and that can be documented uh, routinely because it is consistently present during every terminal dive. And in this slide, you can see some examples of uh, what are we looking for? Like you can see uh, wounds, entanglement wounds. So um, entanglement rope injuries appear as permanent white scars that can look like wrapping scars um, or laceration um, notches. And well, for decades, these type of injuries and scars have been studying on population with good understanding, such as the uh, group of main humpback whales and the North Atlantic right whales by the Center for Coastal Study and the New England Aquarium, uh, correspondingly. Uh, as an addition search for information on the nature and frequency of entanglement in this area. These studies provide a consistent metric for evaluating entanglements over time, uh, how the entanglement uh, rates uh, change over time. And we also can detect entanglement trends based on the sex of the animal and the age class. Also, we can monitor the effects of management, management effort applied to reduce entanglement such an example, um, we can uh, look the effect of gear modifications as. Uh, this uh, method has been applied independently uh, to study the rate of entanglements in other uh, species or uh, populations uh, around the world. The majority of these studies found results similar to the work done in this part, uh, in this area, uh, with the humpbacks and the North Atlantic right whale, where more than 50% of the whales analyzed showed evidence of entanglement with a, an annual rate of 10%. This means that at least 10% of the population or the whales analyzed in their studies got entangled every year. Um, however, uh, we, however, we can uh, face challenge applying this method in other species of baleen whales where um, these species do not fluke as often. Um, so um, that's why we came up with this project where we wanna, the purpose is to um, a, is to describe a systematic analysis of injuries in different species of baleen whales witness carrying gear of the US East Coast and reported to the Atlantic Large Whale Disentanglement Network and this only could it be possible thanks to our funder, Marine Mammal Commission. And our goals are uh, to identify other body features, but, but the pedicle or fluke insertion that are most implicated on entanglements in all four species, uh, which is a uh, minke whales, the humpbacks, fin and say whales. We also want to track changes and entanglement related injuries over the time. Uh, we want to estimate the entanglement dura duration and um, facilitate scar studies of entanglement over a range of species and populations uh, around the world. 
uh, the scar based inference was evaluated using data from documented entanglement events uh, coming from sources like uh, the Atlantic Large Whale Disentanglement Network and the Group of, whale, um, group of Main Compact Whale Catalog that is created by the Center for Coastal Studies. We have uh, 20 years of photo documentation of the animals that were confirmed entangled. Uh, the study area goes, it's all the US East Coast that goes from Florida to Maine and part of Canada, the Bay of Fundy and Nova Scotia area. Uh, in total, I am analyzing like around 300 cases from these four species, humpback, sape, uh, fin whales, and minkies. And um, I selected for each case, I selected photos that best represent each body feature. Yeah, let's say that the head, the tail, the dorsal, um, a lot of the photos that I am looking after are look like this ones in this, in this slide. Um, I have, I analyzed already around um, 6,300 images. And um, the level of detail to capture the injuries was based on analyzing three body map areas that are like this. So basically for every photo, I, I coded uh, there, I, I, I code, I, I use this scheme and code them to uh, process later. Uh, every body map area, so every, uh, I um, coded for the image quality, the presence of injury and the injury severity. Uh, so there's some there's uh, some levels of severity that goes from uh, minor injuries to severe injuries. Minor were the uh, just superficial skin abrasions, and the most severe will be injuries that extend uh, into deeper tissues like the muscle, bone, and cartilage. Uh, in this slide, I will show you some um, examples of how these injuries look like. And here you see minor uh, injuries. You, uh, it's only some superficial abrasions on the skin, uh, uh, followed by uh, injuries that will cut into the skin but won't go deeper into the uh, blubber. Um, so these type of injuries can be like in and only small in small areas, but also can extend into the whole feature like this one over here. And going to more severe uh, to severe injuries uh, is this one that is here, um, where the rope it's cutting into the blubber. This one also. And the, and, um, the last one will be, look like that, uh, injuries that will lead into the formation of the body future or worst case, like this one's um, an amputation of the body part. So because of long-term population studies, we have individual data from fin whales and humpback whales. And this will provide us insights about changes uh, in the injuries over time. So the healing process, that's what we're looking for. And as the estimation of the possible entanglement duration. So I don't have results yet. This is a work in progress, but what we're looking for forward is um, it's that these result, results will be important for health managers to understand outcomes of entanglements, uh, also help others to understand entanglements around the world, 
um, and help us to understand how to refine scars, our SCAR studies methods. Um, oh, I forgot about it. Um, thank you. <laughs>